Amen. Well, you can take your seats. I also want to add my uh, warm, almost happy new year to you. I uh, hope that you have had a chance to rest uh, this past week and to reflect and remember the uh, incarnation of Christ with friends and family. And I hope today or tomorrow you'll have time to reflect and remember the faithfulness and goodness of God in this uh, last year and the uh, calling to continue to follow him uh, in this next year. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to uh, John chapter 2, verses 13 to 25. John chapter 2, verses 13 to 25. Let me read it for us. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, Many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. This is God's holy word. As I was reading this passage and reflecting upon this passage this week, the question that popped into my head was, who is this Jesus? Coming out of Christmas, thinking about Christ, perhaps when uh, you think about Christ, you have different uh, images or scenes that come up throughout the Gospels. Maybe you think of Jesus and, and the incarnation, and you think of this meager, gentle baby with, her, with his family around. We think of the Son of God as a babe. Maybe you think of Jesus and you think of him and his teachings to thousands and multitudes of people. Or maybe you think of Jesus and uh, you, you think of him healing the sick, laying his hands upon those that no one would want to go near. Maybe you think of Jesus on the night before he was betrayed, stooping down and washing his disciples' feet. In John 2, it seems as though we find a very different Jesus. We don't find gentle, loving Jesus. We find Jesus fashioning a whip. We find Jesus rushing into the temple and driving animals out and people out. As he cracks the whip and drives the animals, we see him grab the money bags and he's pouring money in the temple. We hear the banging of the table as he flips it. Who is this Jesus? Well, as we come to John chapter 2, let us remember John's purpose in writing the gospel is so that we may believe in Jesus, that he is the Christ, that he is the Son of God. And John's purpose in writing the gospel is not to give us a picture of a comfortable, easygoing, likable Jesus. He is not writing about a Jesus that soothes us on our difficult days but doesn't call us to follow him on our hard days. He doesn't write about a Jesus 
to believe in him and to be saved by him, but not submit to him. No, John is writing so that we would believe in the real Jesus, that we would know the real Jesus in his fullness, in his entirety, that we would not take what we like and leave what we don't, but where we would really see and behold the Lamb of God in his righteousness, in his holiness, in his deity that we would see that Jesus is the one who was with God in the beginning, that we would see that it was Jesus who by his word spoke universes and stars and suns into light, that we would know the real Jesus, that we would know that Jesus is zealous for his Father's glory, for his glory. And in these verses we begin to see a picture of Jesus, a teaching from Jesus that is often neglected or passed over. And that is that Jesus himself confirms his own deity. There are many thoughts, many ideas, and many teachings about who Jesus was, but we are going to learn from the Son of God himself that he himself confirms and shows that he is the son of God, that he is divine, that he is one of the three persons of the Trinity. And that is what we are going to see in our text this morning, that in John 2, we are going to see three realities about Jesus that confirms that he's God's son, so that we will believe in the real Jesus, that we would not just believe, but that we would have a true saving faith in Christ. We're going to see three things. And the first we're going to see is in verses 13 to 17. Christ confirms his deity. How does he do this? The first is he cleanses the temple, the temple cleansing. Verses 13 to 15, it says, The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And in the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. Jesus goes to Jerusalem, and what's interesting about this temple cleansing is the three other Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, actually record a temple cleansing at the end of Jesus' ministry. Yet John records a temple cleansing at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. Why? Why? Well, these are two different cleansings. It's as if Christ is bookending his public ministry with the cleansing of the temple. And we see that Christ, through this cleansing, is zealous for his Father's glory, that the place that was to be set apart for the worship of God has been desecrated, that has been grossly misused. And we learn something very interesting Verse 13, it tells us that the Passover of the Jews was at hand. The Passover of the Jews was at hand. This is interesting because Jesus would have been required to go to Jerusalem. That the Passover was the biggest festival feast that the Jewish people would have. The country would shut down. It would be as if uh, Christmas Day for us in Canada, right? It's the one year Tim Hortons is closed. No frills is closed. The Passover was that for the Jewish people. And it was the time in which they, the, the men would go to Jerusalem and they would remember the night where the Lord sent the angel of death over the people of Israel and over uh, the uh, Egyptians and for the Jews when they had the lamb's blood on the doorposts. The angel of death would pass over them but it would go into the Egyptian households and it took the life of the firstborn that the Passover was the event in which the Jewish people would remember God's redemption. And this was a big deal. The Passover was at hand. Jesus is coming. These three different celebrations that the Jewish people would have that were required to actually come to Jerusalem. Let me read it from Deuteronomy 16, 16 to 17. It says, three times a year, All your males shall appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose, 
at the feast of unleavened bread, at the feast of weeks, and at the feast of booths. They shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed, and every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God that he has given you. Now the the feast of unleavened bread would happen after the Passover, the week after. And Jesus, the first time in his public ministry, is coming to Jerusalem. He's certainly been there before, but he is coming now, public ministry. He comes to the temple, the place where the people of God were to worship God. And notice what it says. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and in the temple... He found those that were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. Jesus goes into the one place where God was to be dwelling, where God was to be worshipped. And he does not find people on their knees murmuring in prayer. He does not find people adoring and worshiping God as he commanded them to. What he finds is buying and mawing animals. He finds men behind desks collecting coins. What is happening? He does not find a place of worship. He finds a marketplace. Why are there animals in the temple? Why are there money changers in the temple? Have you ever wondered, why is this even happening? Well, you can imagine, as John has mentioned, it's Passover. And if all of the the men of Israel are to come to Jerusalem, the place to worship God, some people would be coming from a long journey. And to bring livestock with you to, to sacrifice would be incredibly difficult. They likely wouldn't survive. So what the Pharisees and the Sadducees have done, they have set up shop because they want to help people worship God. And they have sold these animals. People would buy them. In fact, it it says here as well that there are money changers. Why are there money changers? Well, people were to uh, give a, a, a temple tax. And this temple tax was to be minted in the purest silver they could find. So people would come and they would exchange their money for this pure silver. And these people that were doing this exchange likely were getting around 12% commission as well. They were gaining off the people's desire to worship. And Jesus, seeing this, finding this, it's not gentle. doesn't say, let's, what's going on here? Begins to wrap a whip. And with the crack of a whip, the Lord Jesus drives out this gross act within the temple of God. The temple of God turned into a marketplace. And Jesus specifically rebukes these people. And notice, it's interesting, John makes mention that Jesus specifically rebukes those that were selling pigeons. Verse 16, it says, and he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. Why did Jesus Jesus have it in for the pigeon sellers? Well, the pigeons were the smallest of the animals there. They were the cheapest of the animals there. They would be the animal that the poorest of Jews would purchase to sacrifice to God. That this was a lucrative money-making scheme that Jesus finds merchandising, not magnifying of God. What is incredibly sad is that what was happening at Jesus' time often has continued to take place throughout the ages, even today with churches wanting to market the worship of God and extort the people of God. In fact, it says that he drove them all out of the temple in verse 15. 
That word in the original language is the same word that is used in Matthew's gospel when Jesus performs an exorcism. There is such passion, inflamed passion in driving these people out. This was not a miracle of Christ. This was the pure force of Christ, the picture of Christ, zealous for the holy glory of the Lord. It is a glimpse into who Jesus is, that Jesus actually cares about how God is approached in worship, that Jesus actually cares what happens when the people of God gather to worship. Jesus shows us that God actually cares how the the leaders of the church, the temple, were to conduct themselves. And it says in verse 17, his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Psalm 69, nine is quoted there that his disciples remembered that this was a prophecy of Christ. How does Christ confirm his deity? Well, he confirms it with the zeal for his father. The sacred grounds that were to be set apart for God had become a place of trade and gain for man. It's interesting, if you think of these these leaders and the, the, the temple I can just hear them saying, we're just trying to be seeker sensitive. We're just trying to get people in the door. We're trying to help people worship God. For those that can't bring a sacrifice, we're trying to help them. Their efforts desecrated the worship of God and Jesus cared. And this is the truth that we need to grasp. It is the truth that God is particular about how we approach him in worship. How many of us come to worship the Lord on a Sunday morning or uh, personally as we live our lives and there is no reverence? There is no care. God doesn't care about that. He does, he does, he does. Jesus drives them out. And you can imagine as Jesus drives all of them out, all of the animals. You can imagine the leaders of of the temple. Who does this man think he is? In fact, that leads us into our second point, and that is the culmination of Christ's ministry. Christ confirms his deity by cleansing the temple to have the authority and the zeal and the passion to see God worshiped in purity and in truth. And he is questioned by the temple leaders. Look with me at verses 18 and 22. Verse 18 says, so the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. These temple rulers Who do you think you are, Jesus? Who are you to come into the temple and to turn it inside out and drive us all out and drive all the animals and the money changers? Who are you? And they ask for a sign. It's interesting, of all the things Jesus could say to them, of all the signs, of all the miracles that he could say to these people, What he says is astounding. He doesn't say to them, what sign do I give? I have turned water into wine. He doesn't say, I am going to heal blind people. I am going to heal leprous people. He doesn't say, I am going to multiply loaves and fish. He does not say, I'm going to walk on water. That will be a sign for you. 
He does not say, I am going to raise up men from the dead. That's not what Jesus says, no. No, he says something greater. He says something more amazing. Remember, as they're asking this question, they are not looking for some mere information. They are challenging his authority. Who are you, Jesus? And clearly they didn't think he was a lunatic because if he was a lunatic, they would have dealt with this a lot differently. There was at least a shred of questioning that this was a heaven-sent prophet. In fact, we can know that because in the next chapter, John 3, which we looked at the last two weeks, is that Nicodemus, one of the leaders, he comes to Jesus and he says, we know you are a prophet because no one can do these things that you are doing. And Jesus, what he says to them is astounding. Let me read it again. Jesus answered them in verse 19. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Jesus shoots back and he says, you want a sign? Let me tell you about the greatest, mightiest work that I will ever do. The pinnacle of my ministry, the culmination of all the signs that I will ever do. You want to know what gives me the authority to do this? Destroy this temple and raise it up in three days. Jesus would not tear down the temple brick by brick. He would not rebuild it brick by brick. Certainly he could do that. He was gonna do something far greater. He was speaking of his death and his resurrection. And what's fascinating is that even the disciples didn't get it. Did you catch that in verse 22? When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. That the disciples quietly standing there and Jesus says, destroy this temple and raise it up in three days. They have no idea what he's talking about. Jesus is inviting the the leaders of the temple to destroy his body, to crucify him. And that he will, by his power and authority, raise it up again. Why would Jesus mention this sign? Well, anyone who could restore the temple in three days certainly had the authority to determine how it was to operate. And this is what Jesus is getting at, that he is not just a heaven-sent prophet. He is not just a man. He is the son of God. That he has the authority to cleanse the temple. He has the authority to lay his life down and pick it back up. What's also interesting with this passage, we learn that we no longer need to worship at the Temple Mount. We don't worship in a place anymore. We worship a person. Jesus is establishing this in this text. Perhaps you've uh, heard of uh, a man named Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel uh, wrote a book called The Case for Christ. He's written a bunch of other books, but he's known for this book, The Case for Christ. And the story of this book uh, is really fascinating. Uh, his wife, he, she comes to faith in Jesus Christ, and um, Lee was a staunch atheist. He did not believe in Christ. He was upset that his wife believed in Christ and he was going to set out as a uh, journalist, I believe for the Chicago Tribune, Tribune, I don't know how to say that paper, maybe you do. He was a, a journalist and he wants to piece together a piece that proves that Christianity, that Christ isn't real, that you shouldn't believe in Christ. And as he begins to piece together this case against Christ, he comes to the reality and the fact that there is one thing that he needs to disprove if he is going to knock Christianity out under its feet. And it is the resurrection. He doesn't have to disprove that Jesus didn't turn water into wine. He did. But he realized it is the resurrection. And as, as Lee dug deeper in his study to find resources and to try to back up that Christ never rose 
What Lee comes to the overwhelming conclusion is that Jesus Christ is alive, that he died and he resurrected, that there are no bones, that the stone has rolled away, Christ has risen. And Lee comes to saving faith in Jesus Christ, recognizing that it is the resurrection of Christ that again, points and proves that he is the son of God, that he is the Christ. It is interesting when the apostle Paul is writing 1 Corinthians, that near the end of the book, he takes great pains to describe the importance of the resurrection of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, you can read that. I encourage you to read that. You want fuel in your tank, read 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says, if Christ didn't raise, we are to be pitied more than anyone else. But Christ has raised. And he says, oh oh death, where is your sting? Oh hell, where is your victory? The resurrection of Christ is the surest hope for the believer. Do you believe that? Christ It's not a good teacher. He is the son of God. Christ has the power to give life because he has resurrected his. Now I want us to look at the last section of this chapter. Verses 23 to 25. Jesus, he confirms his deity and the cleansing of the temple and showing the authority that he has to do so. And he uh, proves that authority by prophesying about his own death and his own resurrection. That he doesn't just have authority over the temple, he has authority over all things. He has authority over his own life. And in verses 23 to 25, we see that the Lord Jesus can look at each of us in our hearts like no one can look at each of us in our hearts. He can see our hearts clearly, He can see the state that our hearts are in. He can see the quality and substance of faith. And I want us to note, lastly, the counterfeit faith. The counterfeit faith that Jesus sees in the masses, is in the people. Look with me again. This is is a startling couple of verses. Verse 23, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, Many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man. For he himself knew what was in man. This is a startling passage. Because what we see is that many are believing in Jesus in his name because they saw the signs that he was doing. They were believing in the Savior because of his signs. But Jesus doesn't entrust himself to them. Jesus recognizes and sees through the act that the faith that these people had was phony, fake, and counterfeit. It maybe looked real to everyone else. But Jesus is the son of God and God knows the heart. And Jesus knew that their belief wasn't saving belief. They believed in the miracles. In fact, there's a word play here that doesn't come out in our English translation because it would be bad English if they, if they translated it this way. But the word is the same word used uh, with in trust and belief. That if we were to translate it literally, It would be many believed in his name, but Jesus didn't believe himself to them. Or many trusted in Jesus' name, but he didn't entrust himself to them. Their faith was attracted to the miracles, not the Messiah. Jesus sees through it all. What is terrifying is that there are Thousands of people that worship Jesus, that believe in Jesus, but they do not worship and believe in Jesus as Jesus desires them to. And Jesus does not entrust himself to them. 
In fact, this is a theme that will come up throughout the Gospel of John. As, as our series is called Belief, the uncomfortable reality of the Gospel of John is there are blips along the way throughout the Gospel that there are people that have a fake belief, that they are not genuine sheep. John 20, verses 30 to 31. I want you to, again, to listen to this verse. This is John's purpose statement of this book. We've heard it many times already, but listen to it again. Verse 20, or chapter 20, verse 30 to 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The belief that John writes about is one that recognizes that the miracles and the signs point to Christ in his fullness. That it's not just about the signs and the miracles, but it's what those signs and those miracles reveal about himself. That he is the son of God, that he is the Christ. It is startling to think that there might be some in here that have followed Christ, that have believed in Christ, and yet their faith is not a saving faith. In fact, we see this throughout John, as I've said. John 3, 2, verses right after this passage. We, we looked at them the other week. This is Nicodemus. He says, Rabbi, we know that you were a teacher who comes from God, for no one can do these, these signs that you do unless God is with him. John 4 Verse 48 says, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. John 6, verse 14, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world, perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. In John 6, verse 26, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me because you saw signs not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. The reality is that there are many people that came to Jesus because of what they thought Jesus could do for them. That Jesus could accomplish their will and their purposes. That they liked that when they're hungry, Jesus would feed them. When there was a problem, Jesus, he, he's gonna fix it for us. They believed in the miracles for what they would do for themselves, but they didn't realize that these miracles were to reveal the fullness of Christ. What are the purpose of miracles then? It's not that miracles are bad because we know that John, he writes these things so that we may believe well, the miracles are to reveal about the person of Christ, to fully grasp that Jesus is not just Savior, he is Lord. Matthew 7, verse 21 to 23, this is Jesus talking in the Sermon on the Mount. He says this, not every one of you who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast demons out in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. If you think that you come on a Sunday morning, Jesus, he's a great teacher. He, the Bible has just good morals for my kids. I really like the music, it's uplifting and encouraging. I really like being part of the church because it's a community and I can have friends here and the people are nice here. And yet there remains in your life areas where you hold on to sin and patterns of sin and you think that you can believe in Jesus Christ but not obey his word. That he can be your savior but he will not be your Lord and master. Friend, I do not think that you have believed 
in the real Christ. Because when you come to real saving faith in Christ, you realize that he is not only my savior. He is not only given everything that he has, that he is my savior, he saved me from my sins, but he is now my Lord. And I want to live for him. But if I had a thousand lives, I'd live them all for Jesus. Is that you? We need to ask, is Jesus our Lord? Are we walking in obedience? And it's fascinating that in John, he mentions three Passovers, three Passovers in the Gospel of John, which is unique to John because Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they each mention one. And this is where we actually understand that Jesus' ministry was about three and a half years. Three Passovers, this is the first one. And as Jesus, with each passing year of his ministry, more and more people, especially the, the leaders, of the temple and the synagogues grow increasingly frustrated with Christ because they realize that Christ is proclaiming himself as the son of God, that the frustration builds over time, the resistance builds, that here's the first one and we see that people begin to question Jesus. In John chapter six, that's the second Passover John records and the people begin to walk away from Jesus. And in John 11, Things come to a head and the leaders are looking to arrest Jesus. What you do with Jesus will either drive you to him or drive you away as you hold a false belief that you think you can believe in Jesus but not follow him. And this, uh, this, this leaves us asking, what is true saving faith then? The last thing I want is to leave us, am I, am I really saved? And you, you are really saved. This is a time for us to examine our hearts, no doubt, because the Lord sees our hearts. But what is true saving faith? As 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, that the Lord does not look on appearance, but he looks at man in his heart. The Lord sees our hearts. What is true saving Faith. Well, going back to John 20, believing in Jesus, that he is the Christ and that he is the son of God. You believe that these miracles, that Jesus is a miracle worker, but he does those things to reveal his fullness and his power and ability to, to be the savior of our sins. And to look at this passage, if those that are fake believers, Jesus doesn't entrust himself to them we know that if you are a true believer, that Jesus, he entrusts himself to his sheep. That he gives of himself, that he is the good shepherd. Psalm 23, that the Lord is with his sheep. But there are chaff among the wheat. There are goats among the sheep. And perhaps there are in here some that have flirted with Christianity and have fooled everyone. Friend, you have not fooled God. And then there are some in here that I, I come to church, I affirm that Jesus is, is Jesus, the Son of God, but it hasn't really changed my life. You need to ask God and seek the Lord for the state of your soul. We have lost in 2023 the worry and the anxiety about the state of our own souls. We care about so many trivial things. We care about our cars and our careers and our finances and our vacations and our comforts. And yet we have no worry about where we will be in eternity. We ought to think on heaven and how often because each of us are gonna be in one of the places. Do you know that you have true saving faith? Have you submitted your life to following Jesus Christ? Turn to Christ, rededicate to Christ, believe he is the Christ who works miracles to show that he can save you. He confirms his own deity that we may believe in him. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, 
We give thanks for the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we ask for our own hearts that you would reveal to us any areas of unbelief. Lord, I wanna specifically pray for, for those that might be in here that have believed in Christ, but it has not changed them. That their allegiance is still to themselves and to, to living their life. Their prayer is not, your will be done, it is my will be done. Father, I pray that they would come face to face with the real Jesus this morning. That they would see that you see their heart and that you call them to place their faith in Christ, the one who has died for their sins, the one who has resurrected and the one who has uh, taken his cross and called us to take up our crosses. Father, we rejoice that it is Christ and Christ alone in his work that saves us. And we pray that that reality would move us to, to worship, would move us to marvel at you. And Lord, we pray that uh, today as we end 2023 and as we look forward to 2024, we pray that you would get all the glory in our lives, Lord, that our lives would be a fragrant offering up to Jesus. We pray this in his name, amen. amen.